Hello and welcome to another Sprues and Brews unboxing. Today we are looking at the newest set for Warcry, Blood Hunt. So first of all I want to say a massive thanks to Games Workshop for sending us an early review copy for free to have a look at and unbox on the channel. What we're going to do is have a look at all the contents, have a look at the miniatures, check out the supplement book in here, see how the various warbands play and then hopefully at the end of the video I should have these uh, painted up so we can see what they look like in the flesh. But yeah, this is an interesting one. It was recently announced um, on one of the preview streams and basically pits a corn warband who um, kind of worship flesh horns, uh, Karanak basically they worship and try and emulate, uh, against a team of kind of vampire monks, I guess makes sense. So they look really, really cool. I'm looking forward to having a look at the kits and... Uh, getting some paint on them. So without further ado, should we crack open the box and have a look what is inside. So if we lift the lid off, as we always do with these kind of boxes, we get an awful lot of plastic, a uh, majority of which is the scenery in the box. So what we've seen for Warcry is that there's been a couple of shared frames across all the kits, but then they do a few different things that kind of change the silhouette. Um, in the case of Blood Hunt, a lot of the trees have got like barricades and stuff around them, lots of walls. So yeah, we'll um, have a quick look at these. Again, some of this is going to be existing stuff that we've seen before. So we have got the same kind of um, like barricade and, and bridge sprue that we've seen in the other kits. We also get uh, one of these trees here again, which again is very similar to... Um, Right, it's the same, it's been in one of the previous boxes, but it's built differently with some of the different parts in the kit. So speaking of different parts, we get a couple of frames in here that um, basically add some um, kind of walls that go around the barricades, which is really, really nice. So if we have a quick nosy at that. These kind of get fixed around the trees, which I think is pretty cool. They look, um, makes them look quite different to the trees in the in the main box, even though there's like shared components here. And then we get another one of these, which has got some cool little details on too. So yeah, look forward to building these up. From a, from a painting point of view, uh, you're probably gonna be able to leave these bits separate um, spray them up, paint them, then attach them to the tree. Might make it a little bit more easy to, to paint up. Obviously we'll have a look at how this all goes together when we get to the instructions, but yeah, they're pretty cool. And then there's a final scenery sprue in here. Now, unfortunately this one got a little bit damaged on the way here. Should all be okay, but I think this bit of sprue has just come off there. Uh, and again, this is one of the other uh, trees. I think this one came in the core box as well. I think it's the one kind of growing out of a skull. So, yeah, that's the, that's the same kit as that one. So, that's pretty cool selection of scenery in there. But the main appeal of this box are the two new warband sprues. So, if we zoom in a little bit and take a look at these. So, first of all, we've got the vampire warband. These are very, very nice. Uh, probably my favourite out of the two warbands in the box. Uh, and a very different style than we've seen from uh, other vampires in the Age of Sigma range. They're basically, um, yeah, like I say, vampire monks. We've got some cool stuff in there that we've kind of not seen before. There's one that's kind of becoming a bit more kind of feral and bestial. They're all kind of like swords. There's a bit of a, I guess a bit of a samurai kind of vibe to them too. But they look really, really nice. And we're looking forward to getting some paint on them. They've done a really nice kind of orangey kind of robed scheme that they've done in the book, which we'll see in a little bit. So we'll put them to one side for now. The other warband are the Corn Warband. So like I say, these guys worship Karanak. So with that, there's lots of kind of like flesh hound masks. There's even a guy who's kind of like dressed as a flesh hound on all fours, kind of running forward, which is really cool. It's um, It's been a while since we've had any new corn kind of infantry. We had the, um, 
the ones that came out at the start of Age of Sigmar, the Blood Warriors and Blood Reavers. So this adds another kind of like, I guess, flavour of Corn Infantry, which is nice. I kind of hope that these guys, uh, you know, battle line when the new book comes out, which hopefully does come out this year, and gives us some more options for for AOS uh, Corn Armies. But uh, yeah, if I play as Warcry, you've got the full Warcry Warband here with lots of options. So if you slide the box back in, in here we've got the kind of the usual goodies you would expect from a Warcry box. So you get a big plain surface, double sided, um, easy to fit on a dining room table, which is one of the kind of advantages of Warcry. It doesn't need quite as much space as um, AOS. We've got the main book, which we'll have a look at in a bit. And all the instructions and stuff. We get bases for everything in the box and a set of cards. So if you've not played Warcry before, you get quite a few card components in here. So uh, there are two decks, one for each of the two warbands in the book. Now we'll look at the stats of these properly uh, in the, in the kind of the book when we look through that. We'll just have a quick flick through here so you can see some nice images of the various warriors. Really, really like that guy. So yeah, there's some fun stuff you can do with these. Uh, and they're kind of an integral part of the, the, the game. These will show all your stats of your various fighters. Makes it really kind of easy to pick up and play for new starters as well. And then we've got the um, the Corn Warband. And again, like you say, there's lots of nods to Flesh Hounds because they worship Karanak. So yeah. Very, very brutal, like you would expect from the Warriors of Corn. So yeah, really nice kit. So that is in there. Uh, you also get some cards for um, setting up your scenarios. So for example, if I get these on screen, we've got various deployment maps and like objectives and twists along with um, layouts using all of the components in the box. So you can use these to basically randomly determine a mission with all your kind of objectives and scenarios and, and even down to where all the scenery goes. Again, makes setting up a game of Warcry really, really easy. So there, a really nice touch. Then finally in the box, before we jump onto the Predator and Prey Warband's home, we get the instructions and the kind of sheets for each of the two warbands. So again, we'll have a proper look at these when we get to the, the book kind of part of this review. But uh, the Askurgan True Blades with the vampires. And again, they look really, really nice, don't they? Their um, reactions on the back and their, their various actions and stuff. Again, we'll have a look at that in a little bit. And the Claws of Karanak, you also get a stat card for these as well. And again, it's handy to have these to just pop down on the battlefield uh, so you can remember all your abilities and stuff. So before we jump into the kind of book itself and have a look at that, what I just wanted to do is have a look at the instructions and see how these go together. One thing to kind of bear in mind with games of Warcry is that there's often a couple of different ways to build your different warriors. So... It's always worth having a look at the rules, from a rule point of view, to see um, kind of which options you want in your warband. But then also, some of them are just like purely aesthetics. There might be different optional heads and stuff, different poses that you can do. Um, a lot of the time, in these boxes, you'll always be able to build a thousand points worth of miniatures out of them. So there's no wrong way to build your force, especially if you're painting them up for fun. But from a competitive point of view, you might want a different mix of weapons. So obviously, we've got um, you know a couple of options here for these. And because you get multiple guys that can go in each kind of like uh, way of building them, you've got some options on how you do it, which is which is always handy. I always try to have a few of each, and then if you do want to add some more, um, you can always pick up another box and, and add another couple of models to them. And same with the corn guys, looks like we've got a couple of different poses for them. A couple of different heads for the leader. Uh, and again, some weapon options for these guys. So, again, it's a case of just um, working out which ones you want to build. And, um, yeah, don't get too worried about building them wrong. 
Um, but if you are doing it competitively, you might just want to double check the rules and just see what options you do want in your warband. So in addition to that, we also get the rules for building all the scenery as well. Uh, this is going to be very similar if you built any of the other Warcry scenery from this season. Uh, a lot of the pieces are, are very much the same, but then have some extra parts that go on them, like all these kind of wooden elements. So that should make them fairly quick to paint as well, because you know if you painted some of this before, uh, I do have a guide over on spruceandbrews.com uh, showing how to build some of this. Uh, it's it's really quick to paint up. I sprayed it um, kind of like a, 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 a kind of bone colour and then use lots of contrast and washes and stuff over. You'll see a few elements where it does advise you kind of painting the part separately. So in fact, some of these like panels and stuff, you could probably get away with painting on the sprue as well. Uh, you've got something to hold on to then. And again, it's lots of bamboo, so that should be fairly quick to do. So yeah, um, I think there's probably less scenery in this one, like pieces wise compared to the other boxes. Obviously the volume of plastic, a lot of it kind of goes into the the barricades and walls and stuff that are around these trees. Uh, the warbands are definitely really fun looking. So what we're going to do next is have a look at the Predator and Prey book and see how these uh, warbands play and have a look at all the cool stuff in here. So this is basically, it's a, it's a warband tome, essentially a, a mini kind of battle tome that covers the two factions in the box, all the rules to play them, the scenery and some narrative about them as well. Which is really nice. These these books have kind of uh, built upon what's happening within the gnarl wood. Um, maybe less of a focus on the on the Seraphon ship and this one. We learn more about these two vicious factions, which is uh, pretty cool. The um, claws of Karanak, in particular, are quite an interesting warband. They um, they see cowardice and taking shelter. Um, as an affront to their, you know, their idol, Karanak. And so anyone they deem as being cowardly or weaklings, they will go out of their way to um, basically punish and hunt down and kill, which is which is fair enough, really. Um, so yeah, they're, they're fanatical Karanak worshippers. They, they love flesh hounds. They kind of dress themselves to emulate them. Obviously, we've seen the guy on all fours that kind of looks like a flesh hound at first glance so lots of kind of yeah little touches to that which is really really cool um the, the corn they're fairly um i guess no nonsense and more overt than some of the other chaos cults but yeah they're, they're pretty brutal i like to see their lore maybe expanded out in the um the blades of corn book if that does come out this year out of the two warbands though, the ones that really kind of captured my attention are the Askurg and Trueblade. So this, these are essentially vampire monks. They, they've got monasteries, they kind of do meditation in there, they kind of train their martial skills. And basically they're trying to um, defeat the inner beast through meditation and martial arts. So I've just got visions of this, you know, temple filled with orange robed vampires training their, their their weapons and meditating to try and defeat the beast inside. Now some of them unfortunately do um, fall under the sway of the inner beast. And that's where we see the, the things like the curse buds and the pariahs who've maybe kind of fallen into that savage kind of um, state. But through training and meditation they manage to kind of redeem themselves and, and get back in the in the fray. One of the things that these guys do is head out into the Gnarlwood and uh, kind of ritually hunt the biggest, scariest, most dangerous monsters they can find and then drink the blood of that monster to basically like symbolise them uh, defeating their inner beast. So really, really interesting faction. I'd love to see these guys kind of get fleshed out a bit more in Age of Sigmar as well. You know, we've got a lot of kind of wolf flavoured stuff within the Soulbite Grave Lords at the minute and I'd love to see the, uh, the True Blades maybe at the very least be a battle line option so you can take a full vampire army without having to have just blood knights it'd be really cool to have some um kind of vampire infantry like the um the bloodborne and, and these would be a really good niche for that so yeah let's see what we get in the uh the future books for both these armies because i think they do fill some some gaps that you know 
maybe needed to fill them with some nice new models to kind of breathe a bit of life into those factions. But no, really, really cool. So obviously that's the, the kind of like the lore section of it. The main kind of bulk of this book is um, kind of the, the rules and, and campaigns and stuff. Now we do get the full rules for both of these warbands in here. So we'll take a look at these now. The claws of Karanak are, um, are really nice. So let me just zoom in here a little bit so you can see those stack cards a little bit better. I have got images of all these over on spruceandbrews.com as well if you can't make them out too well there. But uh, yeah, these are a pretty nice faction. Um, we've got lots of attacks, lots of way of getting extra attacks, lots of spikes of damage on these guys too. Um, I think kind of gaining additional attacks through loads of actions is their main gimmick. So they've got a reaction, uh, Bafe Coward's Blood, Basically, if a fighter makes a disengage action, um, all attacks against that fighter get plus one attacks for the rest of the battle round. So that's really, really cool. But there's loads of ways of getting more attacks on top of that as well. So Blood for the Blood Guards are double. Fighter can only use this action if an enemy fighter has been taken down by an attack action made by them this activation. This fighter makes a bonus move action or a bonus attack action. Uh, Flaming Breaths are double. Roll the dice for each enemy fighter within an inch of this fighter. On a 4 plus, allocate 3 points of damage to the fighter being rolled for, which is pretty good for finishing off some wounded uh, fighters, perhaps. Uh, Pack Hunter's a cool one. So you need things with the Agile keyword, which is your Hound of Wrath and your Blood Whelps. And basically, the one gets to activate immediately after the other one, so you can kind of stack your activations, which is pretty good. Especially for a double as well. Uh, and then you've got Horrifying Trophies as a triple. You can use it if an enemy fighter had been taken down by an attack. Um, until the end of the battle round, visible enemy fighters within six inches cannot use abilities, so that's really strong. If you can kill something early on in the battle round with like your first activation, maybe, and then you've just got this six inch bubble shutting down um, actions completely, abilities completely, um, yeah, that's pretty strong. We've got a triple, the scent of weakness. Fighter can only use this ability if an enemy fighter has been taken down by an attack action made by them this activation. Until the end of the battle, as uh, until the end of the battle round, add one to the attack characteristic of melee attack made by visible friendly fighters within 8 inches. Again, really kind of goes into stacking those extra attacks on these guys. Um, and then we've got a quad savage mauling. This is really cool. So you pick an enemy fighter within an inch that has a wounds characteristic of 20 or less. You pick them up and place them anywhere within an inch of your fighter. And then you can make a bonus attack action. But that basically means you can pick them up and like throw them off objectives or maybe move them into a position where they can get attacked by some of your guys. So really like that one, it's pretty cool. Um, obviously we see there's lots of ways of getting extra attacks. If you look at the Pack Lord with five attacks at strength five, uh, damage two but five on crits. If you can kind of stack up those attacks using a few of these abilities and the reaction and the like, um, you can potentially get an awful lot of attacks and, and quite enough damage to take things out. Um, toughness wide, you've got threes and fours across the board. Strength mostly four on our guys, but five on the um, the pack lord. Pretty quick on things like the Hound of Wrath, but an average kind of five movement and everything else. So kind of middle of the road stats, but um, obviously with the abilities, there's lots of ways of stacking up extra attacks and the like. Now moving on to the um, the True Blades. These are an interesting faction. We've got less attacks, perhaps than the um, the corn force. However, what we do have is surprisingly high strength. I think the lowest strength that we've got is four on the uh, the Throat Taker Acolyte, but everything else is like strength five plus. We've got strength six in there with the Mace and the Exemplar. The Exemplar in particular, he's only got three attacks, but you're hitting it at strength six. Standard four, crit six damage. And again, there's ways of getting more attacks off on these guys as well to make them punishing. Um, yeah, toughness three and four, obviously leaves them a little bit vulnerable, but their reaction, uh, lofty disdain, allows you to add one to the toughness when you're attacked. So that's a little bit of a way of keeping you in the fight. Um, they are a little bit more fragile perhaps than some of the warbands, so having that reaction to add an additional kind of pip of toughness is quite handy. And then for their abilities, we've got Moment of Savagery. Uh, it's similar to the Corn one. Basically, you take down a fighter and you can make a bonus move or attack action. Uh, Beast Familiar is a cool one. It's a double. It can be used by the Pariah. 
and you pick an enemy fighter within 20 inches and until the end of the battle round they can't make disengage actions so you can leave people kind of pinned in combat which is really cool uh, terrifying howl is a cool one that can be done by the cursed blood and until the end of the battle round enemy fighters within three inches cannot make reactions so that's a nice way of shutting down some of those powerful reactions that we see on some warbands uh, ma ma magisterial poise is a triple that can be used by your exemplar uh, you can only use this ability if an enemy fighter has been taken down by an attack action made by them this activation until the end of the battle round you add one to the attack characteristic of all friendly visible fighters within eight inches so nice way of getting those attacks up on your guys and again you do pre hit pretty hard with some of those guys uh, perfect strikes a really good one to use on a lot of the kind of high critting ones as particularly the exemplar uh, it's a triple and until the end of the activation you get crits on a five plus which is really cool and then another really good one to use on your leader is worthy foes it's a quad uh, but until the end of the activation you add two to their move characteristic and two to their attacks characteristic. So at that point you'd be hitting on, what, five dice, strength six, standards fours, crit six. He can probably take out most things in one hit with that. So yeah, really good ability. I like both these warbands. Obviously they're both quite aggressive warbands too. That kind of plays into, I guess, the theme of this box. So moving on through the rest of the book, like with the other ones, we get rules for um, the, this terrain that we get in the box. Now, there's more of a theme of kind of like fortified scenery pieces. So you've got a lot more kind of walls and um, kind of, I guess, line of sight blocking stuff that you can't get through that you're going to have to scale with like ladders and the like. That is expanded further with rules for fortifications. So basically this um, allows, if you use it in your scenarios, one side to kind of like create a fortification um, and then the other side to be able to try and besiege it so the attacker can take like ladders and stuff to try and get up it so like a nice little war cry siege scenario which is really fun so i'm looking forward to trying that out that does come into effect in some of the uh, scenarios later on in the book too so speaking of we get all the usual campaign stuff that you'd get in the previous uh, supplement box so quests for both of the war bands as you'd expect these are all kind of like themed around what your warbands will be doing within the Narwood. And then we get two campaigns as well. And again, this follows a very similar theme to um, the other ones that we've seen. So it's a branching campaign arc. You play three missions out of a possible six, and it all depends on who wins or loses the fights, which is pretty cool. And then the second campaign arc again, like the other ones that we've seen in other supplements, it's designed to be a four player battle. Um, basically each player's got a stronghold that gets assaulted two times by different warbands using the, um, the fortification rules that we've just seen earlier and then it culminates in a big battle where the kind of winning side builds a massive kind of stronghold and then the other three warbands kind of team up to try and take them down so again really really nice fun one that plays into that fortification so while some people might have been disappointed that the the scenery was a bit chunky in this one it is really needed for the kind of, I guess, it, this is War Cry Siege, I guess, this uh, this expansion, which is cool. And um, obviously, if you've got other pieces of terrain in your uh, collection, you could even have a, you know, a, 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 use a castle or something. You can easily adapt this stuff to other kind of environments rather than the Narwood. Uh, and then, yeah, like with the other books as well, you get the maps in there and the victory conditions and all that stuff on the printed cards. You don't get the... Um, the terrain cards, now I don't know if I mentioned during the unboxing, but the terrain cards have a variety of stuff on them which lets you use just the stuff in this box or combine it with the scenery at the previous boxes too. So you've got multiple different layouts depending on what collections you've got, which is really cool. Uh, and then we get a new bit at the back, fortification deployment maps. That is for use in those fortification games to show you kind of where the defender's territory is to set up all their terrain. So. Again, really nice. And then finally, like we normally get, is all the kind of origins and names and stuff um, to kind of give a bit of flavour to your warbands. So yeah, that's really fun. What we're gonna do now though, is have a look at the models that come in the box. And here's a look at the assembled models from the box. Now sadly I've had a chance to paint all these up. I've started working on the, uh, the True Blades, which are really, really cool. Going for kind of like, 
orange robes on them to kind of capture that kind of monk vibe that they've got going on. Um, all of my Soul Blight Grave Lords I um, have painted with purple skin to kind of represent the weird kind of vampire nature. So gone for the same here. Um, I've managed to do one model in the box and that's the Cursed Blood who's just coming round into focus now. Um, yeah, really, really fun model to paint up. I'm looking forward to uh, getting the rest of them done. Um, I kind of want to expand my Soul Black Grave Lords with this kind of orange as a spot colour to go through it because I think it works really well for them. Uh, I'm also looking forward to painting up the other half of the box which are just coming round now, the, um, the Claws of Karanak. Uh, in particular, the, the guy on all fours, dressed as a flesh hound, is just amazing. And the, the lead is quite big and chunky too. Um, I guess visually, they're, they're quite similar to existing corn models that we've seen before. Like, um, Blood Reavers, I guess, are the closest thing to them. But on closer inspection, having built the models, there's quite a few cool um, flesh hound flourishes on them. So they've got like flesh hound masks on them. Obviously you've got the obvious one like the guy on all fours, but uh, definitely a different look to them compared to some of the other um, corn infantry that we've got for the mortals. So I really hope that these guys become a battle line choice perhaps in the new Blades of Corn book if one does come out this year, which I, I, I'm fairly certain will come out at some point. Uh, I think the release is meant to be pretty fast and furious this, this spring, so hopefully we see them soon. But yeah, it's um, it's been really cool working on these guys and I'm looking forward to seeing what else we get from the uh, both the Soul Black Grave Lords and the Blades of Corn because um, yeah, they've, they've both got some interesting models in this box. And again, these might stay as a unique, cool thing for Warcry. And that's the, the fun thing with Warcry. You can have lots of kind of new, unique stuff that is, um, you know, exclusive to these boxes. And it isn't expanded out further into armies and the like. Um, you know, you've got the advantages that you can do more niche things within Warcry. So... Yeah, I'm also interested in seeing what comes in the final box as well. Uh, whether we do finally get to that Seraphon starship and just what is inside it does interest me too. But yeah, I hope you've enjoyed this review. Uh, we are planning on doing some um, Warcry battle reports on the channel as well. So um, let us know what factions you'd like to see in that. We might kick it off with uh, both of these factions. Um, facing off against each other so yeah check out that um, if you don't already why not give this video a like and give us a subscribe we do lots of unboxings and, and videos and painting streams and battle reports and all that cool stuff so stick around if you enjoy that um, we've also got in the coming week our reviews of kill team and um, the new jet bikes on the way for Horus Heresy as well. Unfortunately, by the time of filming this, uh, they hadn't arrived in time for me to uh, to do the reviews, but hopefully they should turn up within the week, and certainly before they come out, uh, we should have the videos up, so stay tuned on the site for that. But until next time, have a great weekend, and we'll see you soon.